Hello and welcome back again to Wall Street Training's Mergers and Acquisitions Deal Structuring Course. In this segment here, we will look at common deal structuring issues. Let's switch to a new topic. Is there a way in which we can treat the deal legally as a stock deal? Who likes this? The seller likes this. But for tax purposes, and now I'm going to refer more specifically to the U.S., the United States Tax Code, and for other developed countries who have thought through this on their tax code, they may have something similar. But for now, this refers to the United States. However, the concepts that we talk about here are applicable no matter where you are. Tax purposes, treat it like an asset deal. The acquirer likes this because they get the step up in basis. This is called a 338H10 election in the United States. Why is this called the 330H10 election? It's in Section 338H10 of the tax code. This section primarily applies to a corporate structure called an S-Corp. Again, specific to the U.S. and actually other countries also have a similar structure in which the S-Corp is like a regular corporation but with pass-through taxes. Once again in the U.S., Section 754 is the same thing and applies to partnerships such as LLCs, limited liability corporations, etc. By the way, when you're doing a deal that's a public-to-public -public deal, that falls in the U.S. under Section 368, A1, A, B, and C, and there's uh, different nuances there on the differences. This is a public-to-public -public deal. So what exactly does this 338H10 election tell us? It tells us the following. No double taxation for the seller under certain circumstances. No double taxation. What other circumstances? First of all, if you've been an escort for greater than 10 years, and secondly, if you are the subsidiary of a company. There's always going to be additional rules and limitations there. Also, what 330H10 tells us is the following. Let's get some more space. The acquirer, because it's considered an asset deal, can now depreciate the full purchase price. Now, technically, this is what we will call equivalent to the GUA amortization. So we'll say that the GUA amortization is tax deductible. The IRS doesn't look at it as goodwill, and of course, GUA amortization is not tax deductible. We will talk more about that when we get to the FASB and uh, 141 and 142, comparable to the International Financial Reporting Standards number three. So. My terminology for this module will be that amortization is tax deductible. What that really means is you can depreciate the full price because the governments view this as an asset deal, not a stock deal. In addition, you can also shelter against NOLs. In other words, you can shelter NOLs against the gain. Normally speaking, in the regular context of mergers and acquisitions and a change of control, if you have, let's say, a company that has a $100 NOL, meaning that they will net operating loss, they can offset against future income and pay less taxes. They get to carry it forward. Offset against future income, taxable income, let's say. Now, if somebody comes in and buys this company, the, the government says, no, sorry, company A, the target, they earned this NOL or lost the NOL. You can't use it. So they put a restriction on it that says something around 5%. You Typically, it's the 10-year U.S. Treasury. This is the United States tax code. says that you can only use 5% per year of whatever NOL you had upon the change of control. 5% is the 10-year U.S. Treasury. 5% of the NOL per year upon a change of control. In other words, a deal. So now, what happens is, you have to use this basically over 20 years. The present value of that will be significantly lower. If we have something like this, and we were deciding to do a 330H10 election, regardless of the deal structure, regardless of the S-Corp or the subsidiary, 
at the very least, you can now say, if I had a gain, if the target had a gain of uh, on capital gains of, I don't know, 200 bucks is their capital gains upon the sale, upon the change of control, they can offset the $100 NOL immediately and use it right away instead of having the acquirer use it over a 20-year period. New taxable gain. That, in a nutshell, is what also the 338H10 election allows you to do. Now what I'd like to do is take a step back and also talk about goodwill amortization again in a slightly different context. What I want to talk about is the rules that were passed in around 2001, FASB number 141 and 142, which was the same time that the International Financial Reporting Standards number 3 were issued. They were timed concurrently. So, let's now talk about FASB 141, 142, and IFRS number 3. So I'm going to write at the top here, GAP pre-FASB 141, 142, also International Financial Reporting Standards number 3. What this says is, before this FASB was announced, by the way, 141 in a nutshell was no pooling of interest in terms of M&A accounting. I won't get into it now, it's irrelevant, it's gone. The FASB 142 said, no goodwill amortization for your GAAP income statement. And also purchase price allocation between the two. Goodwill amortization for tax purposes was never tax deductible 